Hello and welcome to episode 27 of Chicago Business Podcast, where we introduce leading executives in the area and learn how innovation is impacting their industries. I am your host, Drew Sakula, and today we welcome Michael Weiss, CEO and co-founder of Spirit Hub, an online marketplace for craft spirits from independent distilleries. Hello, Michael. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. How are you today? I'm doing great. Doing great. Nice to meet you. and Great to have you on. Yeah, no, definitely. Glad to be here. Very, very glad to be here. Nice. Well, uh, I'm excited about this one. Uh, before we get uh, too far in, let's break the ice with our beverage of the day. So uh, this is our first sponsored uh, or unofficially sponsored uh, beverage of the day because uh, you guys over at Spirit Hub have provided the selection uh, uh, to me as well. I had a nice little shipment arrive a few days ago, but why don't you tell us what we're sharing today? Yeah, so we're going to have Sycamore Bourbon. It's an Ohio-based uh, craft spirit from an independent distillery. Uh, we at Spirit Hub focus on craft spirits from independent distilleries from around the U.S. and overseas. All the product that we carry is really hand-selected by our merchandising team. They do an amazing job reaching out to distilleries and working with distillery partners and identifying those, those really great products that you can't maybe get at your local liquor store and really bringing those to new markets, right? So instead of going to your local liquor store on your corner and buying the same thing you've been drinking for the last 5, 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 or plus years, you know, you can actually try something different, maybe something a little bit uncommon, right? So we really focus on delivering uncommon craft spirits. That's great. That's an interesting market and, and a, a totally different take. I know that uh, craft spirits have been taken off, uh, you know, recently, but it's a, it's a whole new whole new world for many people, uh, including myself. So, uh, so, Drew, so Drew, I'll tell you, right. So Sycamore, right. So great bottle, amazing product, right. You want me to open it up? I'll show the, so, so the, so the listeners what we have here. Yes. So, so today we're actually going to make a little bit of a, uh, you know, of a, of a, of a little cocktail here. Um, so you understand if you, uh, you know, you would like to drink old fashions, right. We, we were told that you're an old fashioned kind of guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So for most of us, right. We look at bourbon and we say, you know, we want a bourbon old fashioned, right. So one ounce, I like to be a little bit heavier handed on my, uh, on my, on my pores here, right into the glass. Super simple, right. Now we have this bitter milk. We actually carry these products, it makes it super easy to become a mixologist in your own house. Customers around from around want to be able to indulge in like the entire craft spirits experience. So the way they look at it is like, I want to make a cocktail. I want to feel like I'm in a bar. I want to feel like I'm in a restaurant. I want to be able to have my friends over, you know, with the pandemic and everything going on, people want to feel like they're really opening up into like this new experience. So super simple, pour it in, stir it. Now you got yourself a cocktail. That's it. Very good. Well, I'll, uh, cheers to that. I, I matched you, but did a little advanced prep. So yeah. thank you. Also enjoying yeah. this uh, Sycamore bourbon from Ohio. Not bad, huh? Ah, it's pretty very good. good. Very tasty. Yeah. It's a good very product. Tasty. It actually gave me a chance to uh, bust into my Luxardo cherries. I, I recently <laughs> invested in them just uh, just actually a couple weeks back. So it perfect was... Timing. Uh, perfect timing. It was. It certainly was. So. Thank you for that. Um, so yeah, let's uh, take a step back. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your origin story and connection to Chicago. Yeah, no, of course. So I, I grew up in a, an outside suburb of Chicago called Lincolnwood, Illinois. Uh, it's actually where we're headquartered now. Uh, we have a fulfillment center, a retail fulfillment center based out of Lincolnwood. Uh, we incorporated the business you know, in 2017, really got started after an incubation period in 2015 in 2016, right? When you're looking at ideas, you got to formulate what you want to do as a strategy before you go forward. Um, you know, I always looked at when I start this business, where do I want to be? Uh, prior to this, I was actually living in New York uh, for a significant amount of years there, uh, almost six years. My wife is from New York. Uh, we, uh, we got married there. And, you know, in 2014, when I said, you know, I really want to build this business, I want to get into the craft spirits, you know, industry by way of e-commerce and digital, uh, really kind of focusing on craft, I said, we got to do this in a place where I'm most comfortable. So I went back to kind of my roots and I said, you know, let's go back to Chicago. Let's go back to the Lincolnwood area. That's where we kind of said, you know what, let's go meet with the local, you know, authorities. Let's meet with the state authorities. When looking at alcohol as a whole, you have to understand there's a lot of regulatory compliance risks, issues associated with the industry as a whole. 
we as a company took a position when starting this that if you can't do it the right way, don't do it at all. So when we started 2015, 2016, it was all about that incubation period of identifying the right roadmap to a successful journey ahead of us, right? So we said, we got to take these two years and we've got to really develop the business strategy. Um, when we first got started, we had to meet with a series of, you know, legislators, lobbyists, um, attorneys, and really understand the three-tier, you know, three-tier system as a whole. For those of you who don't understand the three-tier system, you have a manufacturer who legally has to sell to a distributor. So you look at this bottle over here, they have to have distribution in each market they go into. They have to work with a series of distributors in each marketplace, and then they have to ultimately sell through the distributor to a retailer. We understand the pain points in the industry. When starting this, I said, I need to create a solution to a problem. All right, Drew, I said, it's got to be a solution to a problem. Otherwise, don't do it, right? Do it the right way, create a solution, and people will come, right? It will start to work. And so today we focus on really helping these craft producers, these independent distilleries grow outside their local market. It's a main focus of ours and in their internal markets where they actually produce their product and help them scale to a national footprint over time. We are partners with these distilleries. And so to my background, it all started out in Illinois because this is where I grew up. This is where I started as an individual. I'm a Chicagoan at heart. Uh, you know, going to the Chicago Bulls games, going to the White Sox games, going to a few Cubs games here, there. Um, but really, you know, getting getting involved in the Chicago Latin area was really my main focus for phase one of the business. Phase two, really expanding outside of that. Right. So at this point, you guys uh, have, um, you guys shipped to Illinois as well as a few other states, right? You've, you've started yeah. to ramp up some some other yeah. places as well. That's correct. So we currently right now ship to three outside states, Nebraska, North Dakota, and New Hampshire. Those three markets are direct ship states. So once again, a little bit of education, every market has different regulations. When you look at the three tier distribution system, and then you also look at the control state markets, which means it's government operated, okay? a little bit more education. Mm -hmm. You have to understand how the intricacies work within one another. So we are currently operating in those three markets as a direct shipper of spirits to consumers. And we do that through a legal framework of licensing that we put in place with the state authorities to ensure we adhere to compliance, okay? All of our packages are all received with a signature and ID required. All of our packages are direct to consumer and all recorded properly to adhere to the tax requirements to those marketplaces individually. Uh, as we look forward this year, we're really focused on expansion and growth of the business. And we envision a large scale into new markets to really build out this offering to make it available to customers around the nation. People want what we have. We just have to bring it to them. So what's great is that we have this marketplace that's all about education and really telling the stories of our makers and ensuring that people can understand why they're buying this. You know, I'll ask you a question. You know, Drew, this is not a one-sided interview. I'm not going to interview you now. <laughs> Stick of more bourbon. Have you ever had it? Of course not. No. Why not? Because they're in Cincinnati and they're tiny and I've never heard of them before. So they're a small batch distillery, right? They're a small product. They're, 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 they're a producer who, who is very focused on taste and very focused on quality. And what they understand is that being an independent business, they have limited resources. But at the same time, though, They've got a lot of customers that just love what they make. And if you've tried it, I mean, you've had it now, right? You're letting it settle in a little bit, right? It's a great product, mm -hmm. right? It resonates with you. And, and if you're a bourbon drinker, it's a great product for you. And we have a ton of stories like that, a ton of products that are available that people just don't know exist, all categories, right? And people just don't know where to find this. But we focus on educating our customers on what we consider the fear of the unknown, making sure that our customers understand what it is they're about to purchase. You know, if I told you, hey, I got this great product, it's, uh, you know, Sycamore Bourbon, it's gonna be north of $40. You might say to me, I'm not gonna invest that. That's an investment, right? You just invested in cherries. You don't wanna invest in that, <laughs> right? Well, the reality is that if you're educated properly through a series of content delivery methods, such as video, like we're doing today, right? Educating the customers from the, you know, the actual distillery themselves, which is what we pride ourselves on, product descriptions that nobody else has, distillery descriptions that nobody else has written and taken the time to really, 
you know, digest and, and really put into a digestible format, we believe the customer will make the decision to make that investment in the product and enjoy that product. That's great. So navigating that three tier um, kind of distribution system, how does that work then in uh, the states that where you are active now? Because um, are you working, are, are you teaming with distributors? Or are you finding a way around the distributors? We don't work around distributors. We remain three tier compliant. There's a lot of companies out there that question the three tier distribution system. They look at the three tier distribution system as a threat. What you have to understand is it's not as much a threat when you understand the intricacies of the system. You need to lean on each tier for their strengths. If I told you today as a retailer, you know what, Drew? I really want to be a producer. I'm going to start making product. You're going to laugh. That's not what I know. I know my customers. I know what they want. And I know what they, what they really demand and what they require as customers. I know how to sell it to them. I know how to get it to them in a convenient way. I'm not a producer. Now you get into you know, moving halls of large quantities of product. I'm not a distributor. If you tell me, Michael, you know what? I want to move you know, 40 pallets an hour from one location to another. I'm going to tell you I have distributor partners who focus on that. If you look at them for what they're really there for, back to the real core, they exist for a reason. I understand there's a lot of hurdles for these smaller producers. So what we've done is, We've studied, we've analyzed the three tiers, and we've created a model, almost like a preferred network, right? In the customer, what they really need, which is a differentiated experience of product. So we work with all three tiers. We do not eliminate tiers. We do not circumvent. I'm going to say that very clearly. We do not circumvent the three-tier distribution. We work within the regulatory landscape. Three-tier distribution system, we as an organization really pride ourselves on remaining regulatory compliant within the three-tier distribution system, right, as a whole. If I told you today, you know, I want to produce product, right, I want to be a manufacturer of product, Drew, and I said, I'm going to make product that, you know, I want to make bourbon, I want to make vodka, I want to make gin, you're going to say to me, you know, Michael, it's not, it's on your wheelhouse, it's not what you know. I will tell you this, in the three-tier distribution system, there's a place for everyone, we as a retailer do not circumvent the three-tier distribution system. We work within the confines of the three-tier distribution system. We work with the producers, with the distributors, and ourselves being a retailer going direct to consumer to ensure that we remain compliant, but also do it to really lean on everyone's strengths within the process to make sure that our customers get what they so deserve. That's great. That's very, uh, very interesting that you've found a way to to provide that service and i know that these uh uh the distilleries that are out there they also have trouble getting distribution outside of their state so you're providing a big service to them as well yeah so so drew we look at it almost like a, a preferred vendor network right we as an organization focus on the distributors and distilleries who want to grow we don't deal with a one-off approach where it's a one distillery. They want to get into a new market because they have a bunch of friends there. No, we focus on scale and growth for all three tiers collectively. So we work in tandem with one another to support the producers. And like I said before, deliver the customer what they want. So how difficult is it then to get into to new states? So getting into new markets... Um, you know, as a retailer is quite challenging. When you look at the landscape, every market is different. So just look at the legal landscape. Being a traditional retailer, Drew, is actually not as big of a challenge. It's when you look at the technology side and you really want to become what we consider a e-retailer, where we're a technology solution, where we deliver direct to consumer online, that's where it becomes a little bit more challenging. In every market we are required, except for the direct ship states, to really hold a, a license to really retail packaged goods. We have to hold a license certificate and have a physical location, a physical location in each market. The physical location that we have to hold has to maintain 
the same requirements any traditional retailer would have to hold. And we will be building those stores as we start to grow market by market and really bringing those into new marketplaces to deliver our customers what they want. You're going to have to open up retail locations in each of these markets. That'd be a cool store to check out though, certainly. Um, But you're starting to take on uh, a fair amount. Yeah. Let's talk about inventory a little bit then. So are you maintaining inventories of, of all of these products as well? We are. So to be a licensed retailer and to maintain regulatory compliance, we cannot take any product on consignment. We cannot we cannot take product at a discount. We have to purchase our product at the, at the wholesale price and sell it at a retail price that, that ultimately um, is, is fair and, and competitive. We as an organization hold inventory and take risk on all of our distilleries. I look at it as taking risk and a partnership. Mm-hmm. When I'm purchasing from a brand that's never been purchased before in a new marketplace, think about the risks associated with that right? Someone's, what if nobody ever buys it? What if nobody wants it? So we have to go through a series of vetting processes to make sure that the product and the brand and the people behind the brand want to engage in the Spirit Hub platform and being a part of the Spirit Hub marketplace, where ultimately they're going to work with us to educate our customers on delivering a differentiated experience. So what does that process look like then for you bringing on a new, uh, a new vendor and the, uh, and like, do the, I would expect there to be some uh, pushback from the existing network until they at least get familiar with it. So, so I always tell people the first story, you know, when you, when you're starting out and you're onboarding brands and you want to get people onto your platform, someone's got to make that first phone call. So Drew, I don't, you don't know me yet, but you know, I'm, uh, I'm not the shyest person in the world. So I, uh, you know, you pick up the phone and you call your first target, right? You say, hey, you know, I'm interested in carrying your product. I want to purchase your product. And so the first conversation was, we already have distribution in Illinois. We're not interested. I said, I just want to carry your product. That's what we want to do. We think that you're the right brand for our vision. And they said, call me when you have 100 brands. So I'll tell you, six months later, after having 100 brands on board the platform, contacting that distillery, it doesn't matter who it is, and letting them know that we have 100 brands that we're going to go live in market in April, but that we need to onboard their content, we need to get them up and running, and that we've scaled from four employees to 12 employees and telling them the whole story at the time, and this is dating back almost two years ago, three years ago, Felt so good, right? So we work with all of our distilleries and we work through a process of really getting to know them. We look at it as dating before marriage, right? You got to date the distillery to know everything about them. You've got to get into like the real weeds and understand and define the go-to-market strategy for each one of your distilleries. This is a partnership. It's not about that first purchase order. It's not about the license that they need to get in order to even ship into Illinois through a distributor. It's not about the process they go to, through to onboard. I can give you all the details and they have to fill out applications with the state and I can bore you with those details. The point is that people want to get their product into market and it's about scale and growing with our organization and ensuring that we tell the story the right way. When we started our video program, Drew, which really was sending computers around the country and doing what we're doing today, right? Doing what we're doing right now and interviewing our distillery partners and educating our, 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 our distilleries on how important these videos are to our customers to digest it directly from them. Everyone was in awe. Today, we don't have those pushbacks of people wanting to get on the platform. People call us now, we don't call them as much. We still do, but less than they used to. People contact us now because we've reached critical mass. People want to be on the marketplace. They want to be part of that 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 model understand we're not like your traditional marketplace where we don't take risk we take risk on our brands we also formulate partnerships with our brands if you contact any of our brands today they will tell you they have a one-to-one relationship with somebody at spirit hub not many retailers can say that for sure yeah 
establishing that uh, up front just yeah it makes all all the difference in the world I think when you uh, you know once once the business starts to grow and you start hitting uh, some of those challenges so um, what has the last year been like so you guys went through actually like a rebrand a year ago and and just completed your first year under the spirit hub name can you uh, share with us a little bit about that journey yeah. So first of all, rebranding a company is not as simple as people think it is. So let's start there. People think that rebranding an organization is like, you know, I'm going to change my logo, maybe a few colors. I'm going to make people feel fun and, you know, be excited. No, it's not that simple. Um, educating your existing customers on a name change is very, very challenging. Acquiring new customers and identifying the story to be told to your new customers is also challenging. Our company used to be called Big Fish Spirits. And uh, to tell you the least, you know, we, we used to get questions. What do you guys do? What do you guys sell? What is this business? And the problem was it worked really well for the distilleries, right? We want to help them become a big fish in a, sm in a, you know, you know, in a, in a smaller pond. We want to help them grow. We want to make them you know, a bigger brand and really resonate with the brand. Phase one of the business was all about content. You look at Netflix as an organization, you look at Hulu, you look at any streaming platform, it's all about content. They're all just really technology delivery channels, right? That's all it is. They want to just deliver content. But without the content, they don't exist. So the, at the beginning, it was all about onboarding distilleries. And I'll tell you the name at the beginning actually helped that story, right? It helped that process. When we made the name change and we updated our distilleries that we were switching over from Big Fish Spirits to Spirit Hub, we explained that we want to focus on the stories behind the brand, the true spirit, the true essence of the companies themselves. And that this is really a hub, right? It's a marketplace for people to come and shop and really educate themselves on craft spirits from independent distilleries. It really resonated. We went through a process. We worked with outsourced, we worked with outside companies. We worked with consulting agencies. We worked through a, a real process of getting all of my staff to buy into this name change right? Company pride for what they're building is everything for us. We are all builders. I don't care what your position is in the organization. You are a builder or you're not on our team. That's how it works. That's who we are. So we believe that when we built this, we built it for national scale. And our biggest barrier was going to be educating our customers. So what better way to educate your customers than to hit them over the head the first second they see your platform, right? Let them see your plat platform and let them know what you do by telling them what you do, right? Spirit Hub, Uncommon Craft Delivered. That's it. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm sure it's taken a lot of resources to get from your kind of concept to where you are today. Uh, what does it look like from an investor standpoint? You have... Uh, has this been bootstrapped or you have outside investors or how does that look like for you? <laughs> so I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I've been in a series of different businesses throughout my career. Uh, I'm young, but I've been in a, a series of businesses. Uh, this is a founder funded organization. Um, there's a series of founders. There's three of us. Uh, we founded the organization ourselves, uh, every dollar in. Um, this has been a multi-million dollar investment um, of ours. Uh, we all feel very, very confident and very, very pleased to where we are today. Every, uh, it's interesting you talk about investment. Um, every decision we make is an investment. Uh, we as an organization, every market we go into, you know, I, I still remember when I met with the, at the municipality level, and I sat down with the, with the village of Lincolnwood. I explained to the mayor at the time, we are investing in your village. We derive tax revenue. We put it back into your guys' hands so you guys can go and you guys can ultimately build the community just like you guys are doing. And then I looked at you know my, my employees, each interview. Are you prepared to each employer? Are you prepared to invest in us like I'm prepared to invest in you? Everything we do is an investment. Um, we believe in the investment. We're pleased with the investment. Um, outside investment at this point in time is not really welcome. Uh, we are retaining equity within the organization. Uh, we're going to continue to build this to a national footprint and we'll continue to scale upwards. We want to retain equity because we believe in what we're doing. That's great. That's great that you're uh, able to do that and uh, have made 
made it this far um, because there's uh, a, a lot to the business already. It's obviously quite substantial and, yeah. um, and you've come a long way so far. So let's talk about that last year and, and, and the impacts of COVID. Um, what has that uh, meant for your business? Well, let's first start out by talking about what we're doing here today, right? We're on a, we're on a virtual uh, Skype session here, a virtual Zoom session. So I, I think it's done a lot to our business, right? Um, I'll tell you the Thursday before the, the uh, you know, we're all in Illinois and there's people outside listening, but, you know, for those Illinois people who are listening today, you guys all remember that, that Friday, the for last day of work before everybody went home. And then, you know, the state home order hit and Monday came and everyone said, what, what are we doing? What are we doing here? And so that Thursday, I received a phone call um, from somebody I'm very close to a mentor of mine. And uh, they told me the, the inside track that uh, there's going to be a state of home order in place starting Monday. Um, I will tell you, I got a little bit of an advantage on others. Um, those three days, all I did was plan. Everyone said, what's Michael doing? He canceled all of our meetings. What's he doing? What's he talking about this fire drill meeting? What's this, what's this four o'clock fire drill meeting? Do we have a fire alarm? What's a fire drill? What are we doing? <laughs> so I sat down with my team and day one, I just canceled all my meetings with them. And I said, guys, you guys know about the pandemic. The pandemic is real. They're talking about the state of home order. And I still remember my entire team is sitting there. We're in, we're in the, the conference room slash uh, warehouse area with all the bottles. And I told all my staff, who knows what this is going to mean for us? I don't want anybody panicking. I want all of you to take your monitor, take your computers, take your belongings as a fire drill to what a stay-at-home order might look like. The world is talking about it. We don't know what's going to end up happening. I didn't want to create panic. Since that point in time, I obviously have had, you know, the onset of panic a little bit, anxiety, stress, right? There's things that went through my head as, as an entrepreneur. We made all these investments. We brought all these people on. We invested in all these people. We invested in all these distilleries. What's going to be with the industry? You know, there was a point where they were saying you might not be able to deliver alcohol because they don't want deliveries and you might not be able to shop alcohol and which businesses are allowed to stay open. This whole thing was crazy. The reality is we rose to the occasion every single turn, every single time we had, we, you know, we had to weather the storm, right? Just like everybody else did. As you I'm sure have read, the alcohol industry has seen a significant shift into online. I hate to say that, you know, we, we, we saw this coming, but we didn't see the pandemic coming. We saw the shift to online coming. We as an organization have been positioned around online only for a significant amount of years now. Uh, we, we, we were in a very, very strong position to be an online marketplace. And has it helped our business grow? I think it's a series of things that helped our business grow over the course of the last year. I, I don't want to position it as a pandemic response. Um, we as an organization have grown. We've hired people during the pandemic. Uh, we, we've, we've brought on 20% increase to our workforce. Um, we've also kind of yielded this, this, this interest from the distilleries overall because they all saw their tasting room starting to hurt. So because of it, they all had to shift online and they heard about this company called Spirit Hub, right? So they wanted representation, but that means more investment for me, not less. And we kept putting money back into it. We kept envisioning this. And throughout the last year, we even started the, Ind the Spirit Hub Independent Distillery Preservation Fund. You know, I tell you, right, I sent all my employees home. We did the care packages. We, we cared about our employees. We started the book clubs. We, we did the whole thing, right? We did it the right way. We showed that we cared about our people. But what was so critical was when I said, after taking care of our people, how do I take care of my partners? And what I mean by partners, not the two founders, the distilleries, the content. How do I take care of them? So we kicked off the Spirit Hub Independent Distillery Preservation Fund, which right now is on, on track to, to almost raising, we're hoping, you know, fingers crossed, to raising $100,000 to give back to the distilleries. We're, we're, we've exceeded, I haven't gotten the most recent update this week, we're exceeded 20,000. I kicked it off with 10 grand. I founded the whole thing and, and built the whole fund, 501c3, not easy again, but got it built so we can, give back to the community. So what does it mean for me? It means constant change, which has never gone away. I told you we're all builders and we're going to continue to be builders. 
And every single time that we have to weather the storm, we as a group get together and we make decisions. We're not ones to quit. We continue forward. Well, you're really bringing a lot of uh, innovation to this, uh, what has been kind of a tried and true business model for, for these uh, for for these spirit businesses uh, over time, do you uh, do you feel like you're kind of have reached that critical mass where there um, where the conversations are a lot easier now, and that uh, you're over that the initial hump, or do you still get a lot of pushback because you're you're you, you know you say you're working within the existing model, but I'm sure there's still a lot of people that are. Um, Skeptical. Reluctant, right? Skeptical, Skeptical right? Yeah. So there's a lot of models out there that make it a lot more challenging for people like me who remain three-tier compliant. Um, there's a lot of companies out there who are licensed retailers who ship illegally across state lines. There's a lot of companies out there who are operating in the gray market. It's created a sense of confusion within the marketplace. But we are so proud of what we've built to the point that we are willing to do whatever it takes to get you on board. We believe every time someone pushes back, it's an opportunity to educate. We don't turn anybody away. We educate you on why we're regulatory compliant. And if you want to get on the phone with my lawyer, you can. If you want to call the Illinois Liquor Commission, feel free. I've got great relationships there. You want to contact the Liquor Commission in the markets we're in, no problem. We are fully compliant and we work with each Government, governing body to ensure that as time continues to move forward and regulation continues to change. As it relates to pushback, I think I answered it a little bit earlier. We have reached critical mass where people are coming to us. You're always going to have those people, though, who always question what it is you're doing. For those brands out there who don't want to be a part of what we're doing, that's okay. You'll come later. You'll come later. You're not going to go away. We're not going to accept the fact that you're not going to be part of our platform. You're going to come later and that's okay. But for right now, we're going to stay focused on the brands who want to be a part of the platform and we're going to help them grow and see their success through. Nice. Well, obviously we're focusing today on the spirit hub uh, brand that you uh, have built up. Um, but you've also have your uh, um, some interest in, in other uh, businesses as well. Um, you, I, I saw one, you're, you're, uh, you, you have a management or a leadership role with a packaging company as well. That's a related business. Is that right? Yeah. So when we started, it's so interesting. You bring that up. I had a conversation about that today. So, um, so air shock, uh, when we started this business as a retailer, we didn't understand how are you going to ship a bottle? So you look at Sycamore, right. And you, and you look at the bottle here, right. And, and, and you might not like this, but I can get up and go show you a few more bottles if you want. But that's a, maybe that for another time. But, you know, we've got all these different bottles and they're all different sizes. You've got different, you know, width, different heights. And we didn't know where to go with it. And I said to myself, I need to find a solution. So I met with all the foam companies. And then I was like, wait a minute, look at this foam problem. You guys want me to store foam for every single package in mass quantities to save money where am I putting this stuff? I have no room, right? And then you're telling me, and then I met with these other companies and they're like, and this solution's amazing. We only have a 20% breakage rate, 20%. I'll never have any inventory. Well, it's because you know it's more slick. It, it looks nicer. Okay, so this is crazy. So my partner, John, uh, founding partner, uh, John has a, a very, very strong background in technology and, and, and an engineering background. And he always says he's the gray hair in the organization. He goes, you're, you're, the, you're, you're, you're the heartbeat to the business. I'm the gray hair. And so I, I, I said to him, I said, we need to come up with a solution. So he worked with a series of, um, of, of engineers and they developed a solution called AirShock. And what AirShock is, it's a robust, robust, packaging solution specific to the alcohol industry. And what it does is it's a fluted system. You probably have seen it before. We have different patents within the space that allow us to do what we do a little bit differently, but there's a similar, similar products in the market. What we do is we, we supply packaging to other organizations, including our own, to deliver product direct to consumers, such as wine and spirits, 
where ultimately you're almost going to have a 0% breakage rate. So I appreciate you asking. Yeah, we started the company as a concept to really help us as Spirit Hub solve the problem that we were faced with. And then we decided to shift into a business model where we actually incorporated the organization, built our own sales team and took it to market where now we've actually exceeded our sales goals because of the shift to direct to consumer. We've seen a significant growth in that business. And we're very, very pleased. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Innovation, my friend, innovation. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, gotta keep doing it. What, uh, so what are you guys focused on now looking out uh, in the future? Obviously new states, but what are, what are kind of the other top uh, priorities looking forward? Yeah, so new states, obviously, you know, it goes without saying we want to expand, right? We want to expand, we want to grow. I think when you look at consumer engagement, it's really, really important to educate your customer the right way. It's also about fine tuning that process. If I told you my website, my platform, my apps, everything were fully built to scale and they're done, they're not. We have a full development team. We've got an e-commerce team. We have a marketing team. We have a creative suite. You know, today we are talking about Q3 goals for new hires, Q2 goals for new hires. We are going to expand this business and continue to grow. I'll be 50 employees. I'll be 60 employees. I'll get to 80. I'll get to 100. I want to grow the business. I want to get it to a point where customers can receive product that they want almost as almost an on-demand service to their needs. Now, what does that mean? It's very challenging to say that. It's not about one hour delivery for me. There's a lot of companies out there that do that. You want to get product in an hour? No problem. Go to your local liquor store. It's available. They're there for a reason. You want to go online and do it? They're still going to deliver you everything you want from your local liquor store. Nothing changes. You just don't have to leave your couch. I want to deliver customers product when they want it. So if it's same day delivery, if it's next day delivery, we have those opportunities. We have those options. And we want to do it in a way where they can ultimately receive the package in a time where they want their package and the package of what product they actually require. They don't want the same product anymore. They want the sycamore bourbon of the world, right? They want to tell a story. They want to educate their friends. They want, to, they want to look at it as like a piece of art. Take pride in what you drink. And I want to continue to do that for our customers every single day. The customer satisfaction that we get from everybody, the repeat order rates that we see, it's amazing. We're almost like your own little secret in your pocket, right? It's like, wow, this place, I know about this place. Oh, I got this great bottle. I can't tell you where I got it from. I wish the viral factor would help me, not hurt me, but it does, it does, it does play that way sometimes. Nice. Yeah, that's uh that's fun to think about. I mean, it really does open up a whole a whole new uh world in terms of uh spirits and and you talk about the about uh drinking the same thing that you've had for you know 15 years and and longer. And I think that a lot of people kind of get set set in their ways, and then there's I guess the collectible game too that you get with some of the bourbons in terms of, you know, how hard they are to, how hard some of them are to get. But then you have this whole different area where it's just um, local, local producers don't have that same distribution out of state, and uh, you just have access to so much more going through your network. So I can 100%. definitely see the value there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. Uh, in terms of uh, mentors and influencers that you've had along the way, anyone stand out in terms of you've, uh, you know, you where do you get inspiration from? <laughs> so I grew up in a family of, of entrepreneurs. Uh, my family's been in the healthcare industry for quite a long time. Um, they uh, they operate different businesses within the Illinois, you know, marketplace. And, you know, my father has been a very, very big help for me in really navigating my, my business career. Um, my partner, John, um, you know, when he makes jokes about, you know, his gray hair, uh, the reality is he's really been more of like a mentor than a partner at times. He's really helped me understand my potential and really helped me grow to where I am today. Um, I feel very, very fortunate uh, to have them both in my career and in my life. Um, and I feel that I've been, I've been able to maneuver faster than most 
because of the people around me. I also look at my staff every single day and people say, how do you look at your staff as a mentor? I look at them because they're experts in what they do and they're doing it to its fullest. And for me, I learn from every single one of them. So I'm very, very pleased to be working with all those people. That's great. That's great. So uh, for people who want to find out more, obviously a uh, place to go would be your uh, website, spirithub.com. I'll yep. include the link to that. Any, anywhere else that people should uh, go to check you guys out? Just spirithub.com. They can download our app at the Apple Store, iOS or Android. Um, we're available. Um, we also have spirithub.com um, as a whole. Um, you know, we, we, we are available to anybody in the state of Illinois, Nebraska, North Dakota, or New Hampshire right now. Uh, there are new markets around the horizon um, as we go forward. Uh, this year, we'll be making announcements of a series of other states. And uh, we're really looking forward to servicing really the national footprint, you know, in, in near term now. So really, really excited. That's great. Well, uh, best of luck to you. Thank you for your time today. And uh, look forward to seeing uh, what you guys are able to make of it. It's an My exciting point. times for you guys. Drew, thanks for having us. I hope you enjoy the bourbon and uh, be good. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you. You too. Take care. Cheers.